Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for all your patience. Um, I have a lot of I haven't been teaching during the pandemic, so this is new to me. I'm good face to face. This is all new. I have a lot of respect for all of you that have had to teach this way in the past year. So um, thank you for your patience. So anyway, the um, the topic here, the name of the presentation is building curiosity through visualization and storytelling. I've been teaching for 40 years and these are some of the things that I do to, uh, I guess to keep them interested and to try to create curiosity. In all the years that I've been teaching, my goal is to help people learn. And I use math as the vehicle to do that, but I want them, I want to uh, initiate learning, not just in my classroom, but outside and anywhere else that they go. So I use some of these techniques to, to get that done. So anyway, um, I've done this in the last five minutes, so we're gonna do it again and hopefully it'll be even better, even though you didn't get to see it. Uh, okay, give me a minute here. Um, okay, so I've got a broom here. Okay, and this is algebra. What I, what I do when I'm gonna show them solving equations, when I first initiate, again, pretty much basic algebra class, I will balance the broom. And uh, I have no specific skill. I'm not, uh, not a magician or anything. Any of you can do this. I'm telling you, you can do this. And then I will balance um, a yardstick on top of this. Now, in, cla in class, I might, it might take a little bit of time to do this, and that's OK, because they're kind of fascinated to get to see something other than math. Uh, if you can't get the broom to balance well, or the yardstick to balance on top of the broom and have them all work out. You can, you can uh, prop the broom up against the chair, which is what I'm doing now, so I don't waste too much of your time. I will balance the yardstick on top of the broom here, and I'll get that going. And then, yeah, okay, all this stuff fell on the floor. I'll be right back. Okay, I used to do this with a piece of chalk. Let me fix this a little better so it's balanced better. Okay, so normally in a classroom, I used to use a couple of pieces of chalk. I've got a couple of nickels here. And what I will do is put the nickels on here. And you notice that it maintains balance. Solving equations, I will tell them, is all about maintaining balance. Doesn't matter which, what, what's on either side. It's about maintaining balance. So then I'll show them an equation. And can you see that all right? Let me, yes, you can. All right. And then I'll say, you know, what's on both sides? They'll tell me five equals five, and there is balance. And then I'll say, just like I added a nickel to both sides and maintained balance, I'm going to add something to both sides. And then I'll ask them what's there. And you end up with 12 equals 12. And there's still balance. I'll impress upon them the fact that it's not the numbers that matter. It's the balance that matters. And we've maintained balance. So then they get the idea that if you do the same thing to both sides of the equation, it doesn't hurt it at all. Whether the equations are very simple or they're really complex, as long as you do the same thing, same thing to both sides of the equation, you maintain balance. And then that leads it into addition property of equality, multiplicative property of equality, and all that. But again, they start thinking, you see the broom or you see a, a yardstick. Oh yeah, I saw that in math class. So once they leave class, there are other, there are visualization things that will bring them back to math, make them think about math class. And again, I bring out the broom, I bring out the yardstick, they start thinking, what's he doing? As soon as you can get them to start thinking what's going on, you've created curiosity. 
And once they're curious about this or anything else, they start thinking, they start picking it apart and they're learning. Okay, so that's one thing. Okay, another thing, uh, teachers tell me, you know, you get together in departments and all that, and they'll always say that students have a hard time understanding the idea of function. Okay, so <clears throat> whether you're talking about high school students, middle school students, adults, whatever, they're all familiar with using a vending machine. And so they put their money in and they punch A1. And they get a Snickers bar or whatever. They punch one number and they get one item. It's not like they put their money in and anything can happen. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. There's A1 and there's Snickers. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. And that's a function, okay? And then I'll ask them, anybody know what B5 gives you? Of course, probably nobody's gonna know, but I, I, I almost guarantee it, somebody's gonna come back tomorrow or the next time you have class, oh, I looked at B5 and B5 is, you know, ginger snaps or whatever. So you get them thinking, you keep them curious once they leave the classroom. Okay, so what's not a function? And you gotta have a comparison so they understand it. Um, and again, I, I teach mostly uh, adults and, and you guys probably all are teaching adults. So at any rate, uh, what do you call the thing in Las Vegas? A one-armed bandit? Uh, I don't know, I'd ask them, they'd tell me. And since I can't hear any of you, so. At any rate, you put your money in, you put your dollar in, your 50 cents, and anything can happen. You put something in, anything can happen. You put something in, anything can happen. That's not a function. A function is only when you put something in, you have an input, and you get only one thing out. So then if you have like y equals 3x plus 2, you can do some math. Now you can show them algebraically. Well, if you put a number in, you only get one number out. That's a function. Okay. And I'm using visualization to show them a math concept. So from now on, hopefully, time they go to the vending machine, they say, oh, we did that. He, he did something in math class about this. It makes them think. And hopefully I'm stimulating curiosity outside of math class where they look at something and they're curious. Like, I wonder how that works or I wonder how that relates to something else. And if it relates to math, that's just wonderful. But in the bigger picture, I want them to be able to learn. And anytime they're curious and they look into something or they try to find an answer, they're learning. Okay. Couple of algebra things there. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I do in my class, and I can get away with it because I'm teaching adults, there's no guarantee that they have to be there. So I will tell them the first day of class, you have to take notes. If I put it on the board, you put it in your notes. Anytime I put anything on the board, it goes in the notes. I will be very organized with the way that I put things on the board. I won't, like right now, I'm just drawing things. I wouldn't do that in a class, but I have mostly an outline form, even in algebra, the pictures, everything. And the first day of class, I'll tell them. And I'll, I'll give them reasons. I'll show them how the brain works and why taking notes is so important and all that. And then I'll tell them, if you're going to stay in my class, everything I put down, you got to put in your notes. And if you don't want to do that, come on up after class and I'll find you a class where, you know, you, know, you won't have to do that. And some, once in a while, I have something that comes up that says, I do better by not taking notes. And then we'll go find them 
a class where that isn't a, a priority. But in my class, every day, several times, you got to put that. I put it on the board, you put it in the notes. Now, what happens though is when, when you're taking, or when people are taking notes, different people take notes at different speeds. So sometimes people are done and they're sitting there waiting and other people, you know, we're waiting for them to catch up. So a lot of times when that's going on, instead of dead time, instead of silence, I'll tell them a story. For instance, when we're doing word problems and we're doing distance equals rate times time, we're talking about speed, we're talking about driving in a car, how long it takes to get someplace and all that. And since we're talking about vehicles, I'll ask them, you know, what, what kind of vehicle do you drive or what, what would you like to drive if you had the money? And sooner or later, And see my art skills aren't all that wonderful, but sooner or later, somebody's going to say a pickup truck. And then I'll tell them the story. You know why they call it a pickup truck? And nobody knows. And I'll, you know, I'll explain. Well, you know, a lot of people think it's a pickup truck because you drive around, you see something, you pick it up and put it in back. That's not why it's called a pickup truck. I learned this at the Henry Ford Museum in, uh, where is it, Fort Myers, Florida. I just learned this a few years ago and I was fascinated by it. And it made me kind of curious about other things. Why do we call things, why do we use certain words or names to, uh, to describe things? But at any rate, I'll explain to them while people are catching up. You know why it's called a pickup truck? And then I'll say, well, back in the day of the Model T, you could go buy a Model T Ford, you know, car, or if you wanted a truck, you could order How's that? Wonderful artwork. <laughs> you could order a Model T with the front cab portion, but with nothing in the back. If you had a business and then you could build a flatbed back here, you could build a box, you could build a, like a little room, <clears throat> you could build whatever you want that would facilitate whatever you needed business wise, you know, if you wanted to carry stuff. But in order to get that vehicle, you didn't go to the Ford dealer, you ordered that from Ford, you ordered essentially a truck base from Ford. And the way you got it is they dropped it off at the local railroad yard and you would have to go down and pick it up. Okay, hang on a second. Oh, I missed, there was a message. Um, if somebody had a question, uh, sorry, I missed it. So you'd have to go down to the railroad yard and pick it up. And that's why it's called a pickup truck. They love the story just like I was fascinated with it. And then once again, my hopes is they become curious about why other things are called what they are. And when they leave the classroom, curiosity, if they look into it, builds learning. And that, that's my most important goal in all of this. I want them to learn math. I want them to go on in life and learn all kinds of things. So little story, they love hearing stories. It's slid in while I'm waiting people to catch up and take their notes. And again, hopefully it's building curiosity. Okay, so enough algebra, what about geometry? Well, bag, if you're at home, I don't know where you are. If you're at home, go grab a bag, okay? If I were doing this in class, I go to the local pick and say of Woodman's, Piggly Wiggly, whatever, and I I'd ask them for 60 bags, enough for a classroom. And I pass, I give everybody two of them. If we were meeting in person, I, I thought we were gonna, it didn't work out that way. I would have gone and got a whole bunch of bags so that all of you would have a bag. And so, and 
This works really well if it's humid out. If it's not humid, you can always add a little bit of water to the top so it bends easier. You bend a little bit and work your way around the bag. And you have all your students do this. And they just love the fact that they get to do something other than take notes, you know? So you work around and the second time around, you kind of seam that fold. And if you do this well, you won't make any tears. And I'm, I'm not really good at this. A friend of mine showed me how to do this. And unlike many of you, if you have a waste basket in your house, you know, you have something that, that looks pretty and functional and, and decorative and all that. Got a waste basket. When I get sick, and I get sick a lot with colds and all that, if I've got bronchitis and I'm going through a lot of Kleenex, it goes in the bag. You have essentially a waste paper basket. And when it's filled with dirty Kleenex, I don't have to dump things out and clean the receptacle. I can take this crunch it up and throw it in the garbage. So, okay, so you taught them how to make something functional at home. It's biodegradable, it's um, renewable. So it's a good thing, just on that note. So what do you do with this in math class? Well, if it's a geometry class, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, okay? You can look at this and I would then, if we were meeting together and ask you, what can you do? And you guys, you'd all, you'd all give me all sorts of answers. But since we don't have two way here, I'll give you what you tell me. Well, in a geometry class, you can have them calculate volume. And since all the folds are a little different, everybody's volume is going to be a little bit different. But it's going to be close. And so they now, now know the volume of a paper bag. And different sized paper bags have different volumes for different, you know, for different reasons. You could also have them calculate lateral area. Even in algebra classes, some of the algebra classes, some of the books will, will do like, uh, um, they'll do area and some of them will do volume. So even in an algebra class, this might work out. But you had them do something with their hands. Your tactile sense makes really good neural pathway memory locations in the brain. So by having them do something with their hands, just like taking notes, this becomes something memorable. And again, once they're outside of the classroom, they see things like this and think, oh yeah, my geometry class, we use, we use the bag in there. Or they'll look at other items, hopefully, because you do this all semester long, you know, um, with all sorts of different things. They start thinking curiously. They look at some shape and think, hmm, I wonder how math fits in that. You know, I'll keep on telling them that all semester. Like, look at math is all around you. Take a look at something. What kind of math things are involved in that? You create curiosity, curiosity then grows into learning, okay? Plus, in this particular case, you get a waste basket. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that's algebra, that's geometry. Some of you are gonna say, yeah, I'm teaching higher level math class. So what do we do there? Well, um, intermediate algebra, college algebra, um, yeah, pre-calculus a little bit, uh, technical math. You're gonna talk about parabolas, okay. So, we got a parabola here. And I'll put it down this way also. Okay, parabolas, you're gonna give them equations. You're gonna talk about the uh, you know, line, of, line of symmetry, the directrix, the focal point, okay. Well, all of those things, in my experience, have been immaterial. They don't care that much other than they know they're going to be tested or you know, they want to get through the class or whatever. And they'll learn it because it's part of the course. Once again, if you can make them curious about what you're talking about, then you create learning. So. I'll talk about this ahead of time before I get into any of the specifics of, of, uh, of uh, parabolas. 
and I'll tell them that, you know, if you put a bulb right there, the light rays bounce out parallel. Well, where in the world does that get used? Well, one of the things that always get used, you know, that, that, that they're very familiar with it, that always gets used is the headlights on a car. Okay. In the old days, they were round and then they went to rectangular and now you have all sorts of unique shapes. But what goes on behind the headlight to make the light beams go out is based on a parabola. So here's the focal point, the focus, the light bulb. And I tell them, well, if you spin this thing around, then you get a three-dimensional parabola. I think it's called a paraboloid. At any rate, if the focal point, if the focus, if the bulb is right at the focal point, you get parallel lines out. And so the light rays, for the most part, all go out parallel. And that's just wonderful. Except in a headlight, you want more things lit up than just a narrow area. So what happens is if you move the light bulb, the filament just a little bit forward, the light rays fan out. And consequently, what you get is a larger area of things being lit up. Also, and again, I would never do notes like this in class. I'm just throwing stuff up there because it's my breezeway and I only have um, one more and all that. But if this is the focal point, if you put the focal point, the light bulb, the filament a little bit behind, this is what happens. The light rays bounce around and end up concentrating in one spot. Some cars today will have a reflective bowl parabola behind the filament. And then this is kind of what happens. By the way, if you turn on the high beams, well, then that focal point moves back a little bit and you're back to parallel. So you get longer distance and more narrow, which is what you want. And that's how light bulbs, that's how headlights are designed. Um, some of the newer cars will have a lens that's right here. And then that lens will decide how wide the, how wide the light rays are and all that. Okay. At any rate, if we give them some kind of real life example of what's going on, they become interested now in the whole workings of a parabola. We're studying light bulbs now instead of just a mathematical concept. They start becoming curious, hopefully, of how else th this can be used. And now you've got continued learning. Um, another thing, <clears throat> the parabolas. If I've got a parabola that looks like this, and instead of a light bulb, I've got a burner that ignites and burns fuel. Well, um, if you're dealing with adults, they might know what the shuttle is, you know, a rocket engine. And if they're high school, they're not gonna, uh, they probably don't know what the shuttle is. They might know what a rocket engine is. But at any rate, if you want a lot of thrust going against gravity, you want, these force vectors, technical math, to be as perpendicular to the ground or directly opposite gravity as they can be. So you have that burner exactly at the focal point. Now, um, you can talk about the movie uh, Top Gun. Most of them have seen it, and all of a sudden now they've got another idea of where math gets used. Okay, Top Gun, there's, there's a scene there where the, the jets are taking off 
off the uh, off the off the um, the ship's deck, our aircraft carrier. I'd say thank you. Somebody would come up with that. You guys were thinking of it, so. At any rate, um, sometimes you want the plane to have as much thrust as possible. And you don't care about stability as much as you care about speed. But if the plane is going to angle into a curve, you don't want that much thrust. What you want is the thrust to be fanned out so you have more stability. And so in a jet engine, if you could move this burner forward and backward to achieve wide thrust or narrow thrust, that would be wonderful, except it's very difficult to build something where the burner is, is that mobile. So what you do is you leave the focal point right where it's at, but you change the shape of the parabola. If I change the shape of the parabola like that, the thrust goes out further. If I narrow the shape of the parabola, the thrust is more direct and you get more speed. Well, instead of changing this, which is really hard to do, you change the shape of the parabola. And if you watch in Top Gun, the rear of the plane. Hello, I hate to interrupt, but we do have another meeting that is going to be starting soon. Well done. Yes, if that's okay, okay. I'm sorry, I got started late, so that's no, fine. you're fine. Okay, so yeah, we'll end it. Um, let me do this real quick. L A F R A T T M at M A T C dot E D U. If you have any questions, you want to get a hold of me or whatever, contact me there. Okay. Well, I guess that's good so enough. Much. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I messed up the beginning of the presentation. I apparently logged out or something. So thanks a lot. Yes. Thanks everybody for listening. Have a have a wonderful day. Stay healthy.